Good afternoon and welcome to the STS-40 post-flight crew press conference. I would like to introduce once again our commander of the flight, uh, Brian D. O'Connor, and turn it over to him. Brian? Thanks, Barbara. Uh, this is really great. Uh, we finally got our whole crew back to be able to talk to the American public. Uh, this is an interesting flight in that only three of us got to come back here to Houston right after the flight. Uh, the four payload crew members had to stay at Dryden for a lot of medical tests and experimentation on their bodies uh, for another week. And so they just got back a few days ago. Uh, we've been doing some debriefings, and uh, now we get to sit together and talk to you about what we did on this great mission. Uh, I'm going to introduce the crew here. To my immediate right is Sid Gutierrez, the pilot, and Tammy Jernigan, who is uh, MS2, mission specialist number two. She was the a flight engineer for ascent and entry. We are the orbiter crew members. And then we have the four payload crew members, Jim Bajan and Ray Seddon, who are the NASA members of the payload crew. And then we have Drew Gaffney and Millie Hughes Fulford, who are the payload specialist members of the payload crew. Without further ado, we'd like to show you what we did on this mission with a movie. And uh, as we go through the movie, we'll talk through it. This is the crew patch. It shows SLS-1, Space Lab Life Sciences 1, as the logo. And this is what it looked like on the 5th of June that morning before we uh, suited up. This is the crew in the suit room. We'd been through this once before, about four days prior, where we had gone out to the launch pad and had an abort uh, due to an IMU problem. So by now we were getting kind of used to this routine. And as you see, uh, the various crew members uh, loading their pockets with the uh, emergency equipment, putting the suits on. Uh, it may not show here, but we were really ready to go. After several scrubs, it was time to fly. On launch day, Columbia performed flawlessly. Now, initially, you may recall the weather was no-go due to some low clouds, thunderstorms, and fog in the area. But after about an hour and a half of hold, a blue speck formed to the west. It moved over the pad, uh, grew in size, and eventually we were cleared to launch. The SSMEs throttled to 100%, but when the SRBs lit, that's when we really knew we were going into orbit. We rolled to a 39 degree inclination to set us up for our flight. In first stage, we really knew we were flying a rocket. It was a solid E-ticket. Despite the hole in the sky, we did penetrate a cloud layer at about 14 to 16,000 feet. It was well within launch commit criteria and it creates some beautiful imagery. You'll see a shadow formed by the sun falling on the rocket plume. You can see the shadow going off to the left there. We opened the payload bay doors about two hours after launch to reveal just a spectacular view of the Earth. Um, we also have a clear view of the space lab in the payload bay. Uh, the space lab was affectionately deemed slave quarters about halfway through the mission. After we had configured the orbiter for space activities, we got to work uh, activating the space lab. We spent about two hours setting up, checking out uh, the environmental control system, the computers, and the communication systems. You'll see Sid as he heads back across the tunnel that we had to open uh, to get back into Space Lab. Uh, after we uh, performed the activation, we got to work on setting up all of the uh, experiment hardware itself. Here you get to see the first view of the first uh, working laboratory in space dedicated to the life sciences. You'll see the experiment hardware in racks along the sidewalls. We have overhead stowage containers and several pieces of equipment down the center aisle. This is Jim uh, performing an exercise test. You can see him breathing on a bag. That system with a gas analyzer allowed us to measure how much the body consumed in terms of oxygen, how much carbon dioxide it produced, and how exercise was affected during zero G, and then compare that with pre and post flight. This was done in conjunction with the uh, State University of New York at Buffalo and UT Southwestern in Dallas. This was the first time that we've actually measured maximal exercise capacity. This is, uh, you see uh, Ray and me uh, doing an echocardiogram. This is an ultrasound test that allows us to image the heart, and with that we can see how much, the f how much fluid shift has occurred, how the heart has expanded, and how well it's functioning in zero-g. 
One of the other core experiments we had was the pulmonary function test experiment, and that was uh, sponsored by the University of California at San Diego. And what we're measuring here is differences in the way the lungs function in weightlessness and how gases uh, exchanged uh, in weightlessness versus on 1G here on Earth. The, uh, all the crew participated in that experiment. Here's Drew doing uh, the barrel reflex experiment. What this does is it puts uh, various, various amounts of pressure on your neck at the pressure receptors that govern, help govern your blood pressure. And by understanding how we change our ability to regulate blood pressure in orbit versus here, it gives us a better handle on the kind of problems we see during entry with uh, blood pressure regulation. Uh, this experiment was designed to look at changes in blood flow and the compliance uh, of blood vessels in the lower extremity in zero G. It's also from the University of Texas in Dallas. Blood pressure cuff is pumped up on the thigh and then we measure changes in size of the calf. Um, here I am spinning Jim in the uh, rotating chair. Uh, we're testing his vestibular response in zero gravity. This uh, was sponsored by MIT. Um, it's much like going in a merry-go-round when you stop suddenly and throw your head down. We're testing to see how quickly we get rid of that opposite reversal spin that we feel. In uh, this experiment, we, uh, instead of our rotating, we put our head into a dome that's rotating and then we measure the response by looking at how the eye responds to the feeling of vection and we compare this to our responses on the ground. The Orbiter crew members uh, volunteered to participate in a number of space lab experiments. We renamed them for simplicity. This particular experiment is officially called BMMD, or Body Mass Measuring Device. We called it Weighing Yourself. Uh, several other experiments, uh, the one you recall with the collar, we renamed that one uh, Suck on Your Neck. It was officially the barrel reflex. And the pulmonary function test we called Blow in the Pipe. One of the advantages to working in space is the short drive time between uh, your work and your home. Here you see it's about 15 to 20 seconds to get from the space lab uh, back to the orbiter. This is uh, Jim and uh, Tammy uh, transiting the uh, tunnel. In addition to the primary experiments, we conducted many secondary experiments, including 12 getaway special or gas cans. They were activated from the flight deck, but they were actually located back behind the space lab. They included investigations of material science, plant biology, and cosmic radiation. One of the other things that we in the orbiter crew spent a lot of time doing during the mission was measuring the uh, air quality. This is one of several experiments that uh, gathered in air samples and looked for things like microbes and uh, particles. We also checked the uh, the sound levels in the vehicle. This is Sid, looks like he's looking for water, but he's not. What he's doing is measuring the sound levels, and we did this on the flight deck, the mid deck, and also back in the space lab. On day seven, we conducted the orbital acceleration research experiment. We flew a number of maneuvers, including a loop, aileron roll, and a 360 degree flat turn. I'll challenge some of the pilots on Earth to match that last maneuver. We were studying the performance of a miniature electrostatic accelerometer device. We also installed an improved uh, filter to uh, help the performance of the humidity separator. It was located under the mid-deck or down in the pit, as we called it, and this yielded some surprising information about fluid flow in a zero-G environment. Brian and Sid are here preparing to do some Earth observations. We photograph the land, the water, and the clouds, not just for aesthetic reasons, but for the wealth of scientific data the photographs contain. Here we're passing through the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, we're going, obviously, west to east. And on the left-hand side, you see Spain, and the right-hand side uh, is Morocco. The Mediterranean Sea is in the, in the distance. Here we have a very nice view of southern Italy, including the island of Sicily. Next, we'll be approaching Kuwait, um, and soon you'll have an unmistakable view of the oil fires that still persist in the Kuwaiti oil field since the war. Since I live in San Francisco, the California coastline was one of my favorite views out the window. 
And UC Berkeley was also another favorite view for all of us since many of us went to UC Berkeley. Down the peninsula we can see NASA Ames Research Center that had a lot of the uh, research uh, animals on board. And coming up in the distance uh, you can see just about center of the screen to the right is uh, the dry lake beds and the Edwards complex there which we were going to land at about uh, four days from the time we took this photo. Here's the east coast coming up and we're, there's the Appalachians just going by the edge of the Palo Bay. You can see the Chesapeake Bay near the center right at the bottom and the Delmarva Peninsula above that. You can see New Jersey, Delaware Bay and up to the Philadelphia area, Manhattan Island, Long Island and all the way up in fact to uh, Cape Cod and that was a pretty nice sight. One of the uh, hardware test objectives that we flew on this flight for the Ames Research Center was to see if particulates and liquids could be contained within this general purpose workstation. Uh, here you see me squirting strawberry uh, punch out of a drink container and you can see that the fluid tended to stick, want to stick on the walls. The particulates that we released from this uh, balloon uh, were entrained a little bit in the airflow which goes from the top of the cabinet uh, down to the bottom. We, we show that we can handle the cages and keep the rats healthy but we also wanted to be sure that, that the animals could be handled and, and uh, taken care of and worked with as they are on Earth. And it turns out it's exactly the same. The, the rats are very comfortable being held like this. This is what you do in a laboratory on Earth. Works the same in space. Both rats and human beings lose both bone and muscle during space flight. And during our flight, we took many samples of blood in order to test the changes in the hormones in, in our blood systems during flight. And we believe that that perhaps is part of the reason we're losing the bone and the uh, muscle during flight. And that was a nice exchange of tubes. Um, it took uh, at least two uh, to three of us to do the blood draws because it was complicated. This experiment uses lymphocytes or white blood cells to investigate changes in our immune system that occur when we leave the 1G environment of Earth for the zero G environment of space. Here we're injecting the cultures with a mitogen that promotes cell division. And by comparing our one G control cultures in our centrifuge with our zero G cultures, we can determine if lymphocyte proliferation is decreased when you go to orbit and thereby may a, a adversely affect our immune system. Um, as many of you know, we had some trouble with the refrigerator and freezers during our flight. And, and here's a picture of um, Jim and Sid cleaning the filters in order to help the refrigerators and the freezers work more efficiently. Uh, this is where we put our blood samples, so it was a very important event to keep them running. Here we're preparing to take some camcorder footage of our jellyfish crew members. Um, jellyfish contain gravity receptors that are analogous to the otolith organs in the inner ear, and by Taking a look at the behavior of the jellyfish, whose gravity sensing organs have developed in zero G, we can compare that swimming behavior um, to their one G counterparts. Um, one thing that you'll notice here is that the jellyfish tend to swim in circles and arcs, whereas on the ground, they simply swim to the top of the flask and float down. This is a test of the medical restraint system um, for possible use on space station. My brave patient Sid here is allowing his astrophysicist <laughs> to test his reflexes. I told Sid if he didn't move his knee, I'd just have to hit him harder the next time. So he became more cooperative. <laughs> and this is simply a demonstration of uh, performing CPR in zero G. It is quite feasible. Um, this is Recessa Annie that I'm performing the CPR procedure on, and she is uh, strapped to the mid-deck lockers. The breaking of bread in space took on added meaning on this flight since we were keeping track of uh, all of our liquid and fluid intake uh, for the metabolic studies that uh, uh, we were doing. We've kept track of everything that we've taken in from a few weeks before flight up until the present time. Uh, we're looking at changes in nutrient metabolism and in probably in food preferences too. Here we are uh, at a typical dinner beginning to chase our food around. And of course it was always a challenge even to try and stay clean on a nine day flight without a good shower. Here Drew is uh, shampooing his hair with a waterless shampoo that uh, we had on board and it worked pretty well, at least for people with short hair or no hair. <laughs> yeah, I'll vouch for that. They, uh, they had warned us that, you know, that we know that various orbiters have slightly different sounds to them and uh, about midway in the mission uh, we noticed a, a sound emanating, it seemed like from we weren't sure where in the mid-deck, and 
trying to discover what it was, and Brian and Tammy were looking around, and they seemed to finally locate it down in the Lyo uh, storage area there. But it turned out that, for some reason, Sid was down there. <laughs> well, once we had solved that problem about what was causing the noise, uh, we really weren't too worried about it, so Tammy just buttoned it back up and went back to work. Uh, about the sixth day, everybody was uh, ready for a little bit of recreation, and we uh, knocked the bike back down in the stove position, and everybody kind of went back for a little bit of gym time back in the space lab. And here you'll see what we think is probably the, the world's record, and probably for the solar system, too, the number of people on someone's back doing a push-up. Uh, Sid's on the bottom, uh, and Drew's on the top, and <laughs> you can see Sid really pumping these push-ups out. But we think it was probably tougher on the people near the top, like uh, <laughs> Drew and myself, as we were slamming into the lockers on overhead. And uh, we did not stop because of Sid's lack of stamina, but rather Drew's uh, pain threshold of my own, probably. The day before landing, we fired up uh, one of the auxiliary power units and ran through a checkout of the orbiter flight control system and the RCS jets. Since brushing your teeth in zero-G is difficult at best, we made uh, liberal use of chewing gum <laughs> to facilitate working in close quarters. We closed the Port Palo Bay door about three hours and 20 minutes prior to the deorbit burn. Um, soon you'll see evidence of possible interference of the environmental seal with the door closure. And uh, also you can see the loose thermal blankets that Jim's going to talk more about later. Then came entry day, and, or entry time. We all got dressed in our orange suits. This is Jim, who was rotating back and forth between mid-deck and flight deck, helping uh, people get in their suits and so on. And here you see our uh, two stalwart payload specialists in their suits ready for entry on the mid-deck. This is a shot taken out the top of the window, and you can see that uh, phantasm that other people have reported where the uh, ions are recombining behind the vehicle as you come down through the atmosphere, and you can see the reflection off of SIDS back there. We came down through entry, did several aerodynamic uh, test inputs. The winds were nice, and we were scheduled to land on runway 22, the concrete runway at Edwards. One of the things that we had to do on this landing was to land a little faster than normal because we were a heavyweight vehicle. And also we did a uh, high speed nose wheel steering test uh, to open up the envelope for the nose wheel steering system on the uh, shuttle. As the nose comes down, you can see the big speed brakes out there on the top of the shuttle to help slow it down. One of the things you probably saw on this flight different from all the other shuttle flights is that we didn't walk down the stairs out of the vehicle. This uh, crew transport vehicle, which is an airport transfer bus, was outfitted uh, so that we can get the crews out very quickly, get them changed, and start doing medical tests and look at the condition of the, of the crew immediately on landing instead of the 45 to 90 minutes that it usually takes. This is really going to help us in the future to get the crews out quickly and get the medical studies that we need for planning our longer duration flights. Plank was not used. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're hearing from the scientists that we had a very successful mission scientifically. This is our crew when we posed for our picture uh, months before the launch. The smiles reflect how we feel today about this flight and all the people that helped support it and make it go.